I was walking down the street in the States a couple of years, 20 years ago, and my phone went, my mobile phone, and I didn't recognize the number. I picked it up, and um, this, this guy said, oh, hello, is that Simon Freakley? So I said, yeah. He said, oh, this is Richard Branson here. And of course, I'd never met him before in my life. So I said, is that Richard Branson, Richard Branson? So he said, yes, I'm Richard Branson, Richard Branson. <laughs> so he said, um, I have a, my friend has a problem, and I'm told that you're the person that can solve it. Uh, and so I laughed and said, you've no idea how many times people say that to me, Richard, that my friend has a problem. It turned out that George Michael had bought what he thought was John Lennon's piano and paid a vast amount of money for it, millions of pounds for it, to only find that it was just any old piano and it wasn't John Lennon's at all. And so he was trying to get Wait, George Michael's it? five million pounds back. Where did he buy it? Like he bought it to an auction or... house, yeah. And did you get it back? We did, yeah. You did? No, no, we did. No, it was a complete fraud. But how did you, so I, what, you call the auction house and say... Well, we just did the provenance on the piano and could show that it wasn't see. the right piano. Anyway, what a story. It was a, it was a bizarre moment, I must say. That was a story there from our guest this week, Simon Freakley, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Restructuring Group, Alex Partners. Now, Dave, to be fair, we caught the anecdote just as he sat down in the podcast studio, but frankly, it was too good not to keep. And he kindly let us keep it in the podcast because it's a story about problem solving. That's right. You know, Elton John, pianos. I mean, we always get the best stuff at the beginning, right, before we actually start talking. But luckily, he's happy for us to keep it in. But, you know, as you say, this is a story about fixing problems. Chief executives across the globe turn to Simon and Alex Partners for help when they are facing some of the biggest hurdles that are happening in the world right now. Yeah, it's not all about pianos. I think maybe at the moment it's more about market volatility and inflation, how you deal with all of that, but really how you also communicate your vision more effectively. I'm David Merritt. And I'm Francine Lacqua. And this is In The City, Bloomberg's podcast connecting you to the conversations at the heart of the City of London. Now this week, Dave, what advice are city leaders seeking from the boss of one of the biggest restructuring firms? That's right. We ask Simon Freakley, Chief Executive Officer of Alex Partners, an international business advisory firm known for its work in corporate turnarounds. And we've seen the name Alex Partners quite a lot around the potential sale of the Telegraph newspapers and Spectator magazine. In our conversation, we talk about how the challenges CEOs face have changed over the last 20 years. We're joined by Simon Freakley, Chief Executive Officer of Alex Partners. Simon, thank you so much for joining us. So when you introduce yourself to someone new, what do you say? I'm like the restructuring guy. I'm, I'm, I advise on all matters. There's nothing I can't fix. Uh, I don't do anything as grand as that. <laughs> I just say I um, run a consulting firm that specializes in difficult problems, often problems that need to be solved at speed. And uh, we're somewhat industry and geography agnostic. We just tackle difficult things. Talk us through those difficult things, Simon, at the moment. How does the, how difficult is the economy at the moment and the sort of problems that are crossing your desk? The UK, of course, has had the triple calamity of Brexit, then the pandemic, and now, of course, this awful human tragedy, which is the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So I think those three things have had individually a massive impact uh, on Europe generally and the UK specifically. And these disruptions layer on top of each other. And of course, it isn't as if nothing else has been going on. You know, we've come to the end of a 30 year super cycle. So everybody's been forecasting a recession. It looks like a small R rather than a big R recession. Uh, and it's yet to really bite. But here we are with um, double digit core inflation. It's a very challenging time. Your industry has come under quite a lot of fire, right? There's this new book by Mariana Mazzucato, How the Consulting Industry Weakens Our Businesses, Infantilizes Our Governments, and Warps Our Economies. Do you feel like you're included in that? Have you had to justify um, consultancy firm fees and, and just your work in general? Everybody's entitled to a point of view. And I think how you use consultants, of course, is tailored to the circumstances. But consultants who don't deliver value for money are always wide open to those accusations. And of course, there are many stories of people talking about being infested with consultants and once they're in, they can't get rid of them. But I think ultimately, the the way in which consultants make a difference is to make things happen with clients that they can't get done on their own. And ultimately, we're only as good as our last job. You mentioned the triple whammy that's hit Britain. Are the problems harder to fix right now? And are you having the success 
with these restructurings, with the consulting that you're doing with companies? Well, interesting, David, uh, probably restructuring is only 20% of what we do. 80% of what we do is helping healthy companies reposition themselves or grow faster. And we know we talked about those three specific disruptions just now, but there are profound shifts going on around technology, around environmental pressures. And it's the multiplicity of these pressures that are so challenging for executive teams and chief executives because they layer on top of each other. These disruptions are, are getting quicker in terms of the cycles that companies need to go through to respond to them. And so what we're finding is that the, the companies that do best, the leaders that do best, are ones that don't wait for perfection. They do it nearly right, but do it now. They have a, a preponderance to move to action because the markets are changing so quickly. If they don't move to action quickly, they will simply be left behind. Do you think, Simon, that the consultancy industry is sometimes used as a scapegoat? So even if you add value, it's easier for a chief executive rather than taking the hard decisions to say, look, I'm going to have a third party tell me this. And so it keeps me popular within my company. The challenge, Francine, I think, with a description of the consulting industry is a very, very broad description of what are really quite different offerings. So clearly there are the strategy consultants, there are um, operational consultants, there are crisis consultants. So I think depending on the nature of the problem to be solved, you know, some of these challenges are fair. But ultimately, a consultant pointed at a problem where they can really make a difference will give speed to insight to understand what the choices are and therefore inform the executive teams what their real choices are. And then having focused on their best choice, speed to execution. And it's the speed to execution that really makes the difference because for whatever reason, it's very difficult to do surgery on yourself. And so companies do find it hard to um, pivot in their operating models or you know, carve out non-core activities or do difficult things. And often it is helpful to have a catalyst, a change agent to make that happen. So, Simon, this would be like what an Elon Musk calling you and saying, I've lost half of my advertisers. What do I do? Talking about self-inflicted injuries. I mean, I think that um, appointing a an independent chief executive is probably the most sensible thing that he's done in the last few weeks. And of course, you know, bringing in an expert who has seemingly made in a relatively short time um, a difference. So, I mean, obviously, Elon Musk is an, an exceptional person, an exceptional business leader, but He's not a specialist in advertising. He's not a specialist in social media. So oftentimes the consultant's role is to work out what the real choices are and then to support teams move to action and make the critical things happen on a schedule. What are the biggest challenges that you think CEOs have at the moment? Or what's on their mind? Is it how do we harness AI? Is it how do we cope with rising interest rates? What are the problems of 2023 that are most kind of front and center of people's minds? Well, David, it's all of the above. And this is the big challenge for business leaders now because everything is moving so quickly. We do this survey every year, 3,000 executives around the world. We ask them what's top of mind for them. One of the interesting statistics that came out this time around from those interviews that 95% of all 3,000 respondents felt that they had to fundamentally change their business model in the next three years. 75% of them felt they weren't making swift enough progress in doing it. So to give you a sense of the velocity of change that's going on, which is the compounding effect of all of these different forces and pressures, it's overwhelming for CEOs. And is, sorry, is, is that stat much higher than it was a few years ago? Significantly higher than it was a few years ago. Another stat which you'll be interested in, I think, uh, we, also, we also ask you know, CEOs what's top of mind for them? What, what, what are they anxious about? Well, 70% of them this year were anxious about losing their jobs, up 20 points from last year. So I've rather joked that we should call our disruption index the, the anxiety index, because that anxiety is becoming real. Simon, I'm going to play devil's advocate, but if 95% are wondering about their business model and the fact that they need to radically rechange, are these companies that should even survive? Well, some of them won't, but some of them will thrive. What our work in this area has also demonstrated is that there are winners and losers at times of profound disruption, and the winners use those disruptions to capitalize on the opportunities that those disruptions present. And so we talk a lot about technological disruption. When you look inside that and look at connectivity, for instance, the connectivity that's facilitated by the three billion or so smartphones and tablets around the world allow consumers to create their own ecosystem of news, of products, by reference to values of organizations. And so it's an example of how using new technologies, companies can pivot 
and actually thrive on the back of these disruptions. But sure, there'll be winners and there'll be losers. Disruption used to be, a, or can be, a good word, concept. I, I, you know, must probably call himself a disruptor. But then m- married with this anxiety that actually the disruption is going to possibly see the end of their firm. That feels what's different at the moment. Are the levels of anxiety higher in Britain than in the rest of your global clients? I don't think so, David. I mean, I think it's a general, it's a general condition for CEOs. I mean, let, let's just sort of put a fine point in it. The job of CEO now is... Um, much more demanding than it's ever been. Why is that? Well, the core responsibilities of revenue growth and earnings growth, dividends to shareholders remain, but there are additional pressures that simply weren't there 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. The need, for instance, to have a voice about the values of the organization, the purpose of the organization, and to comment on important issues of the day, You know, whether it's social justice issues or whether it's Roe versus Wade if you're in the US or whether it's voting changes. CEOs are expected to have a voice on the things that are relevant, not just to their companies, but to their customers, to their employees, to their other stakeholders. And so it's overwhelming for executives. But at the same time, they have a lot more data than they did 20 years ago. So that presumably also makes their job easier. Well, funnily enough, we found it makes it more difficult because often people are data rich, but insight poor. So back to David's question about, you know, in the UK and maybe more globally, is the pressure on chief executives higher than it was? It absolutely is. And this is not because the quality of leaders is inferior to 20 years ago? It's not because the quality of leaders is inferior. In fact, I think one could argue that it gets better all the time. So do you help these anxious chief executives through this process? Do you advise on things like how to communicate a political point of view? That example, David, would not be something that we would advise on. There are specialists that do that, and that's not in our field of expertise. But we would absolutely advise chief executives and executive teams about you know, how their market is moving, where the opportunities in that market uh, might be, how they capitalize on those opportunities, and how they move quickly to action, how they do it nearly right, but do it now. Because what our analysis, and in fact, all of our stories from the front line of working with our clients have demonstrated is that the people that have a preponderance for action, even if they change their mind and pivot the strategies, on average do much better than those that actually are more careful and deliberate uh, and bake out strategies without moving to action quickly. What's the biggest, most common mistake that chief executives make? There are a number of things one could point to. I mean, the days of the hero CEO are over. You know, it takes a team. You know, group heroics will always always try and triumph over individual heroics. So clearly it's important to have a team. It's important to have a diverse team for diverse perspectives. And that isn't just gender and ethnicity. It's also um, in terms of age group. Having an environment, a culture in which challenge is encouraged so that there isn't groupthink. Ensuring that people do have not just the data, but the insights, which of course requires digital tools to be able to read where their customers are going, read what their employees want in terms of quality of work experience that helps them then inch ahead of their competition. So the hero CEO is is a thing of the past. So which is the other most important role? Is the, is the chief financial officer more important these days than they were in the past? I mean, it's difficult to rank people, you know, whether it's this CFO, um, chief financial officer, or whether it's the general counsel, or uh, there are different roles, of course, in different businesses. It takes a team. The CFO, of course, is very important um, in public markets. So if, you know, it's a public company or has public debt, But the team composition, I think, is the most important thing rather than just the individual position. So, Simon, how does it work concretely? So I'm a CEO. I have, you know, disaster on my hands. I have to respond to the press. I have to fix something. Do I call you and then you you build the team for me? Do I call, do you have like lead partners in industries? And actually, what, what kind of service do I get? What we aspire to be is on people's speed dial. So when people have a problem, we may not know exactly what they should do in that given moment. We'll have a good set, good idea as to what they should do to assemble a point of view. And of course, we all have these um, speed dial numbers we reach out to for different types of problems. Some problems, of course, don't elegantly fit into something one should phone a lawyer about or someone uh, something one should phone a consultant about. But I think that a trusted business advisor is critical in those moments, and we aspire to be that for our clients. Can you give us an example? The pandemic, of course, gave us some very real challenges and urgent challenges. So the pandemic profoundly disrupted supply chains. And so when people found that these wonderful just-in-time supply chains, of course, no longer worked, 
it then became a matter of how do we have a strategy that's just in case, not just in time. And so how to very quickly second source materials critical for a production facility to continue. So an example would be an automotive client of ours found, as with so many people in the automotive sector and others, that they couldn't source enough of the right silicon chips for their production process. And so asked us to help with what became a very urgent and important matter because they were literally going to end up with stalled production. And so we ended up using generative artificial intelligence to analyze all of the import data into the US to identify not just where the which the countries were that produced the uh, necessary chips, but narrowed it down to the factories. We're able to model by triangulating uh, different public source information, what we thought their surplus capacity might be. And then in a matter of days, managed to book that surplus capacity in those factories in multiple countries to be able to second source for the automotive manufacturer. And, they, and indeed, they didn't have a delay or an interruption to their production facility. How do you think Britain's doing in the race to kind of assimilate AI into, into corporate life? Do you know, I don't think they're any further ahead than anybody else. I mean, tragically, I think that the UK hasn't been relevant in the technology race. If you look at UK public companies compared, for instance, to US public companies, we're sort of nowhere in technology. We, we missed that boat. Now, I think there's all sorts of reasons for that. I think that there's been a better availability of venture capital in the US, particularly on the West Coast, to sort of seed so many of these enterprises that have now become unicorns. Um, whether that mistake will be repeated with AI, I don't know. The fact that Rishi Sunak you know, went on to the front for to talk about regulation, I think is a good thing, but I think it's very difficult to know how to regulate AI. I don't think people have a clue at the moment. And I'm always very suspicious when the industry itself starts to tell governments that they should take the lead on regulation. Simon, if you think we've missed the boast on technology, in the UK, I mean, is the UK PLC cooked? I mean, all of our economies is based on technology and how we use it. Well, it's so interesting. When one looks at UK public companies, there's a, certainly in the major exchanges, we are overweight in things like mining. Uh, we're overweight in energy. We're really nowhere in technology. Now, why is that? Well, I think that the UK markets, UK investors have largely prized dividends rather than growth. The US exchanges have prioritize growth. The US has a much, much larger pool of liquidity. Uh, valuations tend to be a little higher over there. So it's been an inevitable pull of companies from the UK to the um, US exchanges. Now, is that reversible? Probably not. I don't think that UK PLC is dead. But I do think that, you know, Brexit hasn't helped us. I think that you know, we have lost significance in terms of being a world financial center, notwithstanding, by the way, that, you know, financial and professional services sector generated 64 billion pounds worth of surplus last year, larger than any of the other developed Western nations. But notwithstanding that, I think that we have lost our footing. And you divide your time between New York and London, Simon. Looking forward a few years, do you see London continuing decline in relative importance versus New York as a financial centre? I think so. Uh, unfortunately, I think that my own view is that Brexit was disastrous. I think that we lost some significance in the eyes of the US as it related to our position in Europe. It's no mistake, I think, that President Biden's first international visit after he was elected president was to France, not to the UK. I think that we talk a lot in the UK about the special relationship with the US. Boris Johnson always used to say that that sounded rather needy. And I think he was right. We are in the five eyes from an intelligence and security point of view, along with Canada, Australia and New Zealand. But I think when you look at the flow of commerce and the significance of London as a financial centre, I think we have lost our footing. And I don't think that's reversible. So what happens next as a consultant? Like, what would you advise UK PLC to do? Well, I think UK PLC has got to make sure that its regulatory environment is attractive for business. Obviously, a robust regulatory environment, but a regulatory environment that encourages business to, to keep on uh, building their foundations here. I think that there have to be tax strategies that make that attractive for people. I think that we have to make sure that our talent is fit for purpose. We know we talk a lot about there being a shrinkage of talent, but the talent war is 
is actually not nearly as significant as the skills war, the skills that people need, particularly uh, in a, a digital environment that's accelerating fast. The skills war is critical. So how do we make sure we have enough people with the right skills to be able to keep the business in the UK? Um, are there any particular sectors that you've got your eye on in terms of stress where you feel like there might be more restructurings or maybe, you know, household names going out of business in the next year? Well, I mean, retail, of course, has been profoundly disrupted now for quite a number of years, and that's not going to slow down anytime soon. So I think we'll keep on seeing real challenges in the retail sector. Uh, energy, I think, will continue to be a challenge, of course, and that's even before the uh, the profound disruption caused by this humanitarian disaster over in the Ukraine. And so I, I do think that those two sectors will be high up on the list. Uh, but I think that you know, in an environment where food inflation is still in the mid-teens and we've got significant industrial action now all around the country where, you know, understandably people uh, are resisting small single-digit pay rises in what is a double-digit and core inflation more than um, just double-digit inflationary environment, I think it's a very, very challenging time. Do you ever think that, I guess, M&A between two distressed companies is a good idea? Or, or even one distressed company and one healthy company. It can work, of course. I mean, it's the old sort of adage of two drowning people trying to hang on to each other um, to float. But sometimes it can. I mean, scale can make a difference in a market. So if the putting together of two companies does cause scale that fundamentally changes that market position, then, of course, that is a good thing. Like the rest of the world here at Bloomberg, we're obsessed with um, a lot of the distressed M&A happening in the finance sector. How do you see those deals now a couple of months down the line? I guess the mother of all the stressed M&A was the Credit Suisse UBS deal. I mean, how how is that panning out, do you think? I don't know specifically how it's panning out. I um, Clearly, UBS was the right partner. But, you know, if you also look at, you know, Jamie Dimon and JP Morgan, I mean, they are the solution of choice for the Fed in the US. And of course, they have to make sure they buy at a price that is good for their own shareholders. But the profound disruption that's been going on with regional banks and community banks in the US, you know, not just Signature Bank or or others like that, it is ripe for consolidation. So in the US, I think we'll see real consolidation in the banking industry. Um, in the UK, of course, we've seen that consolidation already. But, you know, HSBC, it is, is it a UK bank? Is it a Chinese bank? I mean, there's a big discussion now as to really where the center of gravity of HSBC is. And so I think the banking industry is, uh, is in a period of profound change, actually. What's the most exciting piece of business you've ever worked on? I remember being dropped in as chief, uh, interim chief executive of a very major uh, Eastern European bank some years ago. And we had 60 days to work out, you know, where the money had gone and was the bank savable. And so that was an extraordinarily intense period, a team of 60 people working night and day to get to the answer, which we did. But often that is an adrenaline fueled period and very satisfying if indeed one can get to an answer and execute it. Um, oftentimes, of course, things aren't quite that intense, but the speed to insight is important because the time really matters in these situations to working out what the best move is and taking it. And it's very rewarding, actually, to partner with clients when they're in those moments. Simon Freakley, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Dave, it's really interesting almost listening to Simon Freakley with a blueprint of, you know, the most common mistakes that chief executive make, what should they should look out for. I don't know whether it's like a 30 page document that he presents a lot of these chief executives with. Um, of course, it's long term planning. He talks about, you know, being able to build a team. And what really struck me is the fact that he thinks it's much harder being a chief executive now than it was 20 years ago. A lot of people may disagree with him because we're also helped by you know being able to recruit talent across the world, which maybe 20 years ago was much more hard because people didn't work from home. That's right. I mean, it's always obviously supposed to be the toughest job as chief executive. Um, and I'm not sure there'll be huge amounts of sympathy out there for the anxiety levels of these of the FTSE 100 bosses. But I thought it was fascinating how it seems those um, levels of anxiousness are getting much worse uh, in the current climate um, and kind of how these bosses don't seem to be able to navigate all of these challenges being thrown at them at the same time. 
I think the, the question is, how do you measure success? Does a consultancy firm or a consultant only become really good at their job when the chief executive no longer employs them? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> if you, once you can do it internally. Yeah. Which is why I thought it was interesting about AI. I mean, I think it's part of the chief executive's job, of course, right now to understand how to harness artificial intelligence to make their job. But it, they don't seem to be capable of doing it. They have to phone a consultant to get that kind of insight. Yeah, it was an interesting conversation. Also, j just um, him not being very optimistic about the future of the UK, saying that actually New York is so much better at doing uh, these things and him asking for better regulation, certainly in London, to help the city of London thrive. I know. When, when you're going to get someone on this podcast, Francine, she's optimistic about the city. That. I'm just, you know, I'm feeling a bit... Maybe we should just all move to New York. What do you think? <laughs> I can't live without Guinness and fish and chips, Dave. Uh, oh, fair enough. Thanks for listening to this week's In the City. We'll be back next week. But in the meantime, if you like our show, please head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts and rate, review and subscribe. This episode was hosted by me, David Merritt. And me, Francine Lacroix. It was produced by Summer Sardi and Moses Andam. Additional editing by Blake Maples. And special thanks to Simon Freakley. 